encounter. What we're going to deal with uh, for the next two and a half days is the philosophy of the evolution of consciousness. And what that means is we'll be looking at the mythology and the cosmology that is associated with the evolution of consciousness. Now, I'm sure the question that is uppermost in your minds is just what is the evolution of consciousness? Well, what the evolution of consciousness is, is essentially the retrieval of the ancient great chain of being. That's this old, um, generally regarded as a sort of outmoded uh, structuring principle by way of which the Middle Ages was held together from about the time of Ptolemy in the first century AD, clear down to about 1500 or so AD. And what that was, as we'll see in detail here, was this sort of vertical spinal column holding the universe together with the Earth at the very bottom end of this and God at the top. And then in between, we have all the hierarchies of the angels. And then on the earthly realm, we have uh, you know, this great chain extending from the minerals and the metals up through plants, animals, uh, the, human, uh, the human being being the sort of top of the chain on Earth, and then uh, going right up through to uh, God. And there's a recursive principle here throughout such that this idea at each level of this chain reiterates itself such that you get, for example, at the level of, say, metals, gold is the noblest. Gold is nobler than lead. Lead is the sort of heaviest lead core. Lead is to earth what earth, the, the two are equivalent. And for example, in the plant uh, kingdom, the oak is nobler than the bramble. Uh, within the animal kingdom, the lion and the hawk and the eagle are nobler animals than the frog and the toad. So we find this principle reiterating itself throughout. And then with respect to the human world, you know, we have the old idea of the pope and the king at the top of the chain as uh, God's earthly representatives on, uh, on the sublunary world. But more accurately, the idea is probably Christ and the Buddha and figures of that sort that are the true visionaries that are uh, at the top of the sort of human chain of being. But what we're going to do is look at all of that in detail here as the night goes on. And uh, the main thing I want to focus on tonight will be a series of cosmological transformations which is intended to show what happened to the chain of being. How it is that it underwent this process whereby it was completely disintegrated by a series of cosmological revolutions within the sciences and then what science did uh, in place of it and how science is now rediscovering the great chain of being. It's sort of, uh, you know, you show the devil out the front door and he comes back in through the window uh, kind of thing. So what we'll be looking at is then uh, ultimately over this uh, weekend is how the great chain of being is sort of coming back now through what the sciences are discovering with respect to our knowledge of the cosmos. And uh, indeed, were we to look at human consciousness, if we were to just sort of uh, step back from the picture and sort of even look at brain architecture, we're almost forced to recognize that the thing is built up out of layers. And the great chain of being does have to do with the retrieval of the idea of hierarchies with different laws applying at different levels. Now, there are many elements in the counterculture that regard hierarchy as something patriarchal, uh, as something that was held together by the church, and uh, something that was held together by the sort of patriarchy to put down the feminine. But of course, that's all ridiculous, and we'll see why that is. There's nothing patriarchal about a hierarchy whatsoever. A hierarchy, it will turn out to be, is simply the way nature is constructed. And um, we'll look at that in more detail. If we were to look at the brain and sort of just sort of glance at the basic way it's structured, we can see that we have, to begin with, a neocortex. And Gebser really focuses, the neocortex is the sort of properly human aspect of brain architecture. The neocortex, um, uh, even Gebser's transformations of human culture are something that he sees situated within uh, the structure of the neocortex. So there are even five stages with respect to that. But if we were to just sort of drop down back below the neocortex into the mammalian brain, we have the midbrain in there, which uh, is what the hominid evolution has poured itself out from. And with respect to the, mem uh, the midbrain, we have uh, emotional, the emotional centers, the nurturing centers. Uh, we have olfaction and the sense of smell. All those qualities that we associate with our pets are uh, down in there, and we are in resonance with that. Even below that, if we drop down again, we have the reptilian brainstem, out of which we have evolved. And the reptilian brainstem has a whole different set of laws there. Those have to do with the instincts for reproduction and the basic survival instincts, what you might say in Kundalini Yoga are the three lower chakras. Um, if we were even to sort of drop down below that and say we went down into the subcellular level of the human brain, and we looked at the neurons and what the brain is composed out of, what we'll see through the lens of the great microbiologist Lynn Margulis, who is really one of my favorite figures in the history of science, is that these little brain cells may, be the, uh, may have been built up out of the ancestors of bacteria who have joined together 
and have sort of given up their motility for the motility of thought and that the human brain may be made up, there are certain proteins in the axons and the dendrites of human brain cells that are identical with certain proteins found in, the, uh, in these bacteria. And it is her theory uh, that the entire, in fact, the entire, uh, all the other animal kingdoms that come after the bacterial kingdom are essentially combinations of bacteria that have been stored up. The mitochondria within our cells, for example, uh, that handle oxygen respiration are very likely the descendants of bacteria that have been encased and miniaturized within the architecture of the cell. The architecture of the cell itself, in terms of its environment, is an exact duplication of the Earth's Archean atmosphere uh, going back two and a half, three billion years ago. So we'll be looking at lots of this stuff, and uh, we'll have a blast with it. And uh, so that's sort of uh, just looking at it from that angle. And now uh, what I want to sort of do is look at, is reconstruct, start with the Ptolemaic system, because I think that'll be our best vector into this material. And uh, the Ptolemaic system is something, of course, that um, doesn't, th wasn't just put together by Ptolemy himself in about 150 AD. His name is associated with it, but it represents a tradition that was common to the Greeks probably from about the period of Pythagoras on down, from about the 4th century BC, 5th century BC, right in there. And the Greeks sort of gradually put it together. So it really represents a kind of collective cosmology of the Greeks. So we term it as Ptolemaic, uh, because we have the Earth as the center of the universe, and we have everything revolving around the Earth. And when we have that, we generally refer to it as Ptolemaic. The Egyptians had an earlier cosmology within which, uh, as we'll see, the entire all the other planets revolved around the sun, but the sun in turn revolved around the earth. So the earth was still stationary, but the center of the entire solar system whirled around the earth. And there are certain uh, astrologers within the Steinerian community. I'm reading this book now by uh, Robert Powell called Hermetic Astrology, who's trying to retrieve this Egyptian cosmology, which is identical with the, cos the cosmology that was proposed by Tycho Brahe, uh, as we'll see as a, uh, as a sort of, it was the primary competitor for the Copernican cosmology. And uh, Tycho Bray said on his deathbed as he was dying to uh, Kepler, he said, whatever you do, please don't build the next system af out of the Copernican uh, vision. Build it out of my vision. And then he died. And then, of course, Kepler went and built the whole thing out of Copernicus. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Freud's relationship to Jung and Freud ins continually insisting to uh, Jung, please do not abandon the sexual theory, whatever you do. And, of course, that was the primary thing that he did. There's a kind of father-son relationship between both of those men, uh, both sets of men, rather, uh, kind of son slaying the father and the father's cosmology in both cases. Uh, Kepler was on his, uh, for example, as we'll get to in a moment, uh, was on his Saturn return when he was invited by, at the age of 30, when he was invited by Tycho Brahe, who was 60, on his Saturn return to come and study with him. So there were all these tensions between both men uh, in that respect. So we'll look at all of that in a second. Um, but the Ptolemaic cosmology then was the prime, it was what won out. And the Copernican cosmology was, in fact, put forth first by a Greek, by uh, Aristarchus of Samos. And it's interesting because Copernicus, in his book, actually said, well, this cosmology first uh, was put together by Aristarchus. And then in later editions, he erased Aristarchus's name. Um, nobody knows why exactly, but it seems to suggest that he wanted to take as much credit as he could himself. Although, as we'll see, Copernicus was a gigantic coward, and he waited until his deathbed before publishing his book. And uh, we'll look at that in a moment. So uh, the Ptolemaic cosmology is what we're going to sort of construct here uh, first. And that will give us a sense of what the worldview was uh, behind this great chain of being up until uh, the Middle Ages. And uh, what I want to do is sort of sort of start from the ground up and look at the Aristotelian theory of matter just very, very briefly. Um, matter, recall, is the primary four elements are what Aristotle has in mind. And first what he does is he sort of constructs these four elements out of four principles where he says, we have these four primordial principles, the hot and the cold, which are opposed to each other, and the wet and the dry are opposed to each other. And when hot, each one has a certain vector. Hot goes straight up. Dry has no direction whatsoever. Wet goes horizontally, and cold goes straight down. Such that when the principle of heat combines with the principle of dryness, we have fire. And fire is drawn, as you know, with a little triangle. It's the lightest of all of the elements. Hot and wet combines with the next heaviest element, air.